Well, uh, Donald Robertson, I want to thank you for joining uh, this Classical Wisdom Kids interview on Marcus Aurelius. You have a book that has just been released, Marcus Aurelius, The Stoic Emperor, which is very exciting. And so you are the man to ask questions about Marcus Aurelius. You literally wrote the book on him. So uh, we have collected some kids' questions from the Marcus Aurelius fan club, and they have some they're very excited about Philosopher Donald um, and want to know all about both you and the book. So we're going to start off with a question from Chris, age five. How do you think about how to write a book? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Anya, uh, for asking me these questions. And thank you to the Marcus Aurelius Fan Club for all of your amazing questions. I enjoyed reading them and hearing about them. So thanks, Chris, for starting us off with a good question. How did I think about how to write the book? Well, first of all, someone asked me to write it. My publisher asked me to write it. But then I had to think about how I was going to go about doing it. So hang tight, because maybe I did it in a kind of weird way. I'll tell you some secrets, Chris. Things that you won't hear often, right? The secret, the secret art of how to write a book about Marcus Aurelius, about whom I've written three books now and some. Um, so first of all, I kind of imagine that I'm writing a book that my son Hector and my daughter Poppy might read when they're a bit older. And that kind of helps me to keep it real and to make it seem interesting and to put it in language that I think people are going to understand better. Because otherwise you're writing a book, you're just kind of not really thinking about like you're having a real conversation with somebody. You know, just looking at a computer screen for a long, it takes about a year or more to write one of these books, a long time. Um, so I try and imagine, and I read it to real people and I ask them what they think about it while I'm in the middle of doing it. So I kind of keep it real that way. Um, and also I get, I pay strangers to read, I print the whole thing out, it's like that, that and then I give it to somebody <clears throat> and they read it to me. And uh, I make little notes while they're reading it aloud to me so that I can make sure it's going to sound cool when it's on an audio book. Huh. And then I have, and then I go to my special writing place and I write. And sometimes I have a picture of my son or my daughter, or sometimes I have a picture of the person that I'm writing about. And so when I'm kind of getting bored and my mind's wandering, I'll kind of look at the picture and I'll think, well, imagine what this guy would say or what my kids would say about the stuff that I'm writing. And sometimes I shut my eyes and I do a special meditation for 10 minutes. And then I imagine that I'm in the place where the person that I'm writing about, so Marcus Aurelius, right, let's say, I imagine going to the place where he, one of the places he was. Um, so I visited some of the real places where these people went, like we were talking earlier about a place called Carnuntum in Austria where Marcus Aurelius was stationed uh, commanding the legions. And I went there for a week. And so I can imagine what it looks like. It's by the river Danube, which is a, in, it's in Austria. It's a big river. And I imagine that I'm talking to him. So I kind of visualize it in my mind's eye for 10 minutes and ask him questions and uh, and say, hey, what? how am I supposed to make sense out of this thing that you did? Like, and I try and imagine what he would say. And that's how I go about writing the book. Do you have like a special writing room that has to be separate from like or set up for where you write specifically? Ideally, although at the moment uh, it's like I'm sitting in it right now and it's now a nursery and it's all painted baby blue and it's got all Hector stuff in it. Like, so I just have to pretend that it's still my office. Sometimes I go to the library and I'll sit in the public library all day long um for a long long time for many many days and just sitting there and work um yeah that helps it's, it's nice having a space um so our next question comes from tom brady uh who is age six and his but his birthday is not very far off so almost seven that's very important um philosopher donald what day does your book come out how did you write your book and how did you feel when you wrote the book maybe he's already seven like, because he maybe he asked this question, or he's seven recent. Well, happy birthday when it comes to Tom Brady. My new book came out on the sixth of February, so when we're recording this, it's a few days after that in the US and Canada. But it won't come out until the twenty sixth of March in the UK, so it comes out on different days. Um, the sixth of February was a Tuesday, 
which is named after Tyr, the Germanic god of war, incidentally, it's a bit of trivia for you, which is appropriate because Marcus's name comes from Mars, which is the Roman god of war. So hey, this guy, Marcus, named after the Roman god of war, Mars, book about him comes out on Tuesday, which is named after the Germanic god of war. So and, there you in, go. In bit Spanish, for you. in Spanish, Tuesday yeah. is Martes. Oh, really? Yeah. There you go. War day. Yeah. Yep. Right? All of the all of the words. Uh, Wednesday is Miércoles after Mercury. Monday is Lunes, um, the Moon. Uh, jueves, Jupiter is Thursday. Viernes, Venus. This Friday, is there. stuff that all kids. I feel like all kids should know. Sabado, this. Saturday, Saturn. Yeah. Everyone should. I feel like everyone should know this. We could have, we, one day we'll have a thing where we just go on about like etymology. Etymology is much cooler than people realize. So I'll tell, cool. can I tell you. Yeah. I tell you my two. I tell you my three favorite words. Right. This is a complete digression. Right. <laughs> Do you know what hippopotamus means? A hippo is Greek for horse, right? Anya's way ahead of me. Hippo. But uh, like, what does potamus mean? Right. It means river. So. Hippopotamus literally just means river horse in Greek. How cool is that, right? And tragedy means song about a goat in Greek. Hmm. And world is Anglo-Saxon, and it comes from were-ald, and the were part is the same as werewolf, which means man-wolf. So were means man, and ald means old. So world means old man Cool. I like it. I told you etymology was really cool, right? Yeah. I like that yeah. in ancient Greece, they used to name people like later when they were older based on their interests and things that they liked doing. And yeah. so Philip, Phil is love and Ip is yeah. the horse. So Philip is just somebody who likes horses. Yeah. And Phil Hippopotamus would be somebody <laughs> that loves river, river horses. horses. Yeah, just like, to say, I think... Lover. I think this would be a fun yeah. game. Like if you were to do this naming tradition now, what would you name yourself based on what you like doing? Yeah, that would be a cool game. Yeah. Okay, so next question. So um, oh, I was going to say, he didn't he say he had another part to his question, oh, yes, which yes, was, yes. what was it? I don't want to uh, shock How did you feel? No, no, no. How did you uh, feel when you wrote your book? Yeah, I, I, well, uh, I felt very grateful um, when I was writing it. Honestly, I think most of the time I felt very grateful because I felt very grateful that I was able to sit in a library, believe it or not, or in a nice warm house. And because my window looks outside and it's snowing and there's blizzards and stuff uh, recently. Um, and so I, I, a lot of time I'm like, I'm just really grateful that I get to work inside and write my book. And it's like I'm doing my hobby for a living. That's a pretty sweet, that's a sweet spot. If you can wangle it so that you get to do your hobby for your living, like like Anya, like that's pretty. Then you're then you're like then you're laughing. Like so, I'm very grateful I get to do my hobby for my living, and I don't have to work outside in the snow. I like that. There's that Venn diagram of what you should be doing, and it's like things that you like doing, things that you're good at, things mm -hmm. that have meaning and are helpful mm -hmm. in the world, and then things you get paid for. So you want to find something that combines all of those if possible it takes a bit of effort to combine all of those but if you can do it then that's great and also venn diagrams are really cool yep. like they can be useful very useful okay so next question is from blue power ranger age five the marcus aurelius fan club's clenet's water bucket boy there you go um he says philosopher donald what's your favorite color what's your favorite food and what's the, your favorite thing in the whole world that's a three-parter okay so thank you very much uh blue power ranger it's the Cleanthes water bucket boy and my favorite color is just blue because that's the color of my eyes that's my viking ancestry coming through and uh, i think the most stoic color is purple though because that was the color of kings and emperor robes and xeno was a Phoenician merchant. The Phoenician people made their living mainly by selling this dye. And they made it by squashing sea snails and rotting them and then picking out bits. It was the most disgusting job, smelliest job in the ancient world. 
and you could only get a tiny, tiny amount at a time. So it was very, very, very expensive. Uh, Tyrian purple or imperial purple dye. Um, so this became very symbolic because Zeno got very rich selling this. But his ship sank and he lost it all. And he said that was the most profitable journey he ever made, paradoxically, because it made him kind of think, maybe life isn't all about sea snails like, and die <laughs> <laughs> or money. Maybe there's more to it than this. And it made him want to go and become a philosopher and a teacher. So, so I, that's that's a good good color then, well, purple. It's a good color to have, right? Um, my favorite food is beef jerky. And my favorite things in the whole world are my son Hector and daughter Poppy equally. Uh, but I also like my wife and my cat. And uh, those are some of my favorite uh, things. And if I'm going to be totally honest, like my favorite object, because I'm, I'm, I, I kind of grew up in the 1970s and playing in the woods and outdoors and stuff like that. Like my actual favorite thing is my pen knife. Like I have this open L, it's a French pen knife. Like, so it's a bit of a boy, boyish thing, like boy scout type thing. Like, and I kind of, I kind of love it because it's a perfectly designed, it's a masterpiece of design. Like, so that's something you could get your dad for Christmas or whatever, maybe one day. Like, have you ever seen open L knives on you? Well, you know, they I was going to say when I was a kid, and... I loved Swiss army knives and I always had a bunch of different cool Swiss army knives. And then, you know, yeah. it, uh, the problem was, is that I always traveled around a lot and there was a, like mm -hmm. a moment in history before when you could travel with a Swiss army knife and they were very practical things to have because they always had, you know, screws and little things that you could yeah. use and tweezers and scissors. And it was so handy when you were traveling. And then they, they became the thing that every TSA agent would like rip apart and throw away. And then, you know, that that really yeah, destroyed the Swiss Army knife industry, I think. Spoiled everything. Like, you can't even take your pen knife in the plane anymore. Like, well, that's, I have, I have, I have a collection of kitchen knives in different countries. That visit. <laughs> oh, well, my second, my other favorite thing is just kitchen knife. Maybe I like, I like knives in general. I, I like my kitchen knives. I have to have good kitchen knives because I cook a lot. Well, down here in Argentina, they have really beautiful knives that yeah, they make out in the in the in the mountains. They have like people from forging from scratch still these like beautiful, beautiful knives. Um, our previous managing editor, Kristen, she her her husband live out in Patagonia making those knives. Uh -huh. So I need to now I know what to get you for your birthday. Knives. Yeah, for my collection. <laughs> Okay, next question from Yaya or Yaja, uh, age six. Thank you for writing the book. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Yaya, for thanking me. Yaya means granny in Greek. But I don't know if this is a real name or a nickname, or maybe it's an actual Yaya. But six seems very young to be Yaya. 60 would be more appropriate for a Greek Yaya. But thank you for thanking me, Yaya. You're, you're very much, you're very welcome. Okay, next question is from Blue Beagle, age five. I think these are all um, creative names. Uh, what do you think about writing a number four book on Marcus Aurelius? Yeah. What about a number 10? Well, what about all the ones in between? Like, I, well, I thought it's too late because I wrote three in a bit books. I wrote a bit of another book and I edited another book. So I kind of wrote three in a bit books. And and then I was like, I need to write about something else. So I've already written another book. Shh, don't tell us. It's not a secret, actually, because it's online now, but we haven't properly announced I haven't officially announced it, but people have found it. Like, and it's called How to Think Like Socrates, and it's about Socrates. So I I like I kind of run out of things to say about Marcus for now. Maybe I'll write more about him in the future. But Socrates is a much more complicated person. And he, there's much more to say about him. That means it's harder. I think it was like about four times harder writing a book about Socrates as it was writing about Marcus Aurelius. Um, and annoying, just to make things worse on you. This is an on you thing, right? Just but for everybody as well. Like, so my thing is to try and write about philosophers, but also to write about their lives and what was going on around them, right? Now, just to, Socrates is a very complex 
character. He says lots of complicated things, right? But just to make it even harder for me, he lived during an event known as the Peloponnesian War, which went on for 27 years and is one of the most complicated and tricky to explain wars in history. Because rather than being between two countries, it's between lots of different cities in and Greece. alliances and such. And they keep and then they go to like, Sicily is oh. there, and then Alcibiades. And then even Sicily, yeah, and Alcibiades. Yeah. And people with names that are hard to pronounce. <laughs> so it was quite hard to make it interesting and keep it fairly simple. But I think we managed to make it simple enough that we can talk about Socrates being in the fighting and stuff in the middle of all this and talking about philosophy. Um, and it doesn't get too like complicated, but we might need some diagrams and maps because a lot happens in the Peloponnesian War. We should set up, you should talk with Robin Waterfield because last I was talking yeah. to him and he was like, I'm not entirely sure Socrates existed. That's he did he is that what he said? He said, I think he existed, but um, all the, we don't know. All the yeah, we don't know which version of him is a real yeah. version. Now we we, think... we we could digress though. We should yeah. we should stay on task with Marcus Aurelius Let's, because right, yeah. stick to Marcus Aurelius <laughs> for now. He's, he's, <laughs> he's sufficient. Um, okay, so this this question um, it kind of follows up from the last one. So this one's from Finn, the Marcus uh -huh. Aurelius fan club Diogenes representative. Why are you writing another book about Marcus Aurelius? I often ask myself that question, uh, Finn. Although it's in, I did, I've written it, it's in the past now, I've written it, because publishing is confusing, because it takes like a year to write a book, and then it, it might be like another six months before it actually comes out. And by the time it comes out, and you have to talk to lots of people about it, because your book's just come out, you're probably in the middle of writing another book. Or in my case, I've already finished writing another book. So it kind of like gets a little bit confusing sometimes, because the publisher asked me to do it, and I said yes, because they asked me nicely. And there are other biographies about Marcus Aurelius, but I didn't think they were as much fun as they could have been. So I decided to write one that I would have wanted to have read when I was 17. So the other thing that helps me write books, in addition to imagining that my kids are going to read it when they're older, is I imagine, like Doctor Who, I could go back in time and show the book to you, for some reason, usually my 17-year-old self. Because when I was 17, I was first beginning to get into philosophy and stuff. But I lived. Do you remember when? I, I, do you remember when everything was made of wood, right? <laughs> in the nineteen seventies. Right? So when I, was, you're not as old. Maybe you're not as old as me. Like so, I I imagine going back when I was a kid. We didn't have the internet, right? And so I had to go and buy actual books, like. And I could never find, there weren't the, that many on philosophy that I could find. It was hard to find. I didn't know what books existed. And the library was quite small in my town. So um, I loved books on philosophy, but I couldn't get many. It was strangely, now you can get any you want on the internet. But I, I was desperate to find books. And so if I could go back in time to my 17-year-old self, where I was like desperately looking for more books on philosophy and go, hey, I wrote this book about Marcus Aurelius, I kind of imagine like writing it in a way that my 17 year old self would have found interesting. That's, that's a great, great response. Great answer. Um, I'm going to, one second. 